Okay, ich schlage vor, dass wir beginnen. Ich würde vorab noch kurz auf Deutsch sagen, die Veranstaltung findet gesamt auf Englisch statt. Und äh, wer eine deutsche Übersetzung braucht, der kann sich ja noch Kopfhörer besorgen. Habt ihr aber alle schon. Super. Okay, so I will switch to English. Um, from my side, only a few words, because as you can see, we have um, a numerous panel tonight, nine people. And so I would like to basically um, just like to welcome you. I'm really happy to have you here, you in the audience. I'm glad that a lot of people came because we weren't sure, to be honest. So it's good that you're all here. And also a really warm welcome to, to you all on the panel And also for traveling so far and for working hard already the last week. You have been here for a few days already. And um, <laughs> or maybe not, some of you who made it. Um, yeah, so um, this um, evening event tonight is basically part of a whole week program for our guests. And they're doing like a workshop here which is part of a research project that lasts for three years and will be introduced by the researchers, of course, themselves. So my task basically is to welcome you, which I did already, and to say thank you to everyone who helped to organize this event. And this is especially my colleague Lisa Eichhorn, who's still standing outside. She did a great job in preparing everything and organizing everything. And also, of course... Big thanks to Carla and Transgender Europe who helped to prepare the presentations who organized content-wise a lot. So the floor is yours. I hand over to Julia Ert, who will be moderating tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. My name is... Um, my name is Julia Erd, and before I start with the event, I would like to extend a very warm thank you to the Böll Foundation to host us here, and especially to Jana Mittag and Lisa Eichhorn, who made all of this here possible. So, as you can see, there are a lot of people on the panel, which means that I will try to not speak very much. I'll just try and um, will guide you through the evening. Um, and the whole evening is structured as follows. We will start with presentations of the TBT project by Carla and Jan. Then we will have two presentations, and then there's a round of discussion. After that, we probably all need a break, so we'll have one. And then after the break, we go on with four further dis um, presentations and have a final concluding discussion, and then uh, we can all go. Um, home and finish the event. Um, before we go into the research project, I'll I'll just is there no um, I'll just um, give a very very brief introduction of Transgender Europe. Um, I am the co-chair of Transgender Europe, and TGEU is a non-profit organization which is registered on the Austrian law. We are kind of a new organization. We've been founded in 2005 on the first International Transgender Council, which was held in 2005 um, in Vienna. At the moment, we have 40 member organizations in 25 different European countries, um, and we work towards full equality and inclusion of transgender people in Europe. Um, all the rest of the information about TGU you can read in the flyer, which is outside there or, or, or on our website. I don't want to um, go into details on that, but um, now introduce our first two speakers, which is Carla Lagata sitting on my right. Um, Carla holds a PhD in cultural anthropology from the Free University of Berlin. She wrote um, a PhD thesis on transgender movements in Brazil, Germany and the United States and carried out fieldwork in Tanzania and the Brazilian Amazon region as well, in, as well as in Rio de Janeiro, New York City and Berlin and taught courses at the Free University Berlin. She's as well a member of the steering committee of transgender um, Europe, and she initiated TGU's Trans Murder Monitoring Project and is kind of the heart of the Trans Respect versus Transphobia Project. Um, and she holds the position of the lead researcher in that project. Um, the second speaker, speaker of the first presentation is Jan Simon Hutter from Berlin. He holds as well a PhD, not in cultural anthropology, but from the geographical department of the Open University in Milton Keynes in the UK. Um, his doctoral project investigated LGBT politics of anti-violence and citizenship in Brazil. And before that, he studied psychology at the Free University. And he, since 
August 2010. He's the second researcher in the TVT um, project. And now I'll hand over the microphone to Carla, who is uh, beginning with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for the introduction. Uh, we will in the following present the structure of the Transrespect versus Transphobia Worldwide Research Project. And this project is conducted by Transgender Europe in close cooperation with partner organizations, with trans movements and local activists and researchers in all parts of the world. And it makes me very happy to see that we are able to present some research results together with our partner organizations and with representatives of our partner organizations and that they made such a long way to come to Berlin, some traveled three days to reach this place here and it's very great. Thank you so much for coming to Berlin. Um. Well, on the, on the screen you see the website of our project, the TVT project, and this website exists in two versions. One is the English one, and the other one is the Spanish one, and these are the two main languages of the project. And this project is combining scientific research with social activism, with human rights activism, and moreover, um, the TVT project is a research project designed to produce research results that can be used in human rights activism instead of uh, serving a priori the scientific community and discourse. And some aspects make this project unique. First, it is the first research project focusing on trans people on a global scale. Second, it's conducted in close cooperation with partner organizations in all parts of the world. And third, it is not only focusing on transphobia and forms of discrimination on counts of gender identity and gender expression, but also on it's, it's also focusing on trans respect and forms of uh, equality and acknowledgement of trans people. So we try to balance this and not only reporting these negative aspects, but also reporting positive aspects or researching positive aspects. Yeah. And... Thanks. Um, yeah, therefore, the main goal is to provide research data and tools for activism, or for activist advocacy work. And we also um, provide recommendations to institutions, governments, to uh, improve the human rights situation of trans people. And we will present, as I said, uh, we, are very we are very balanced best practices and examples of trans respect to and our website serves, to uh, serves as a structure to present all this data for activism. And in a comparative way. So I, I said we cooperate closely with partner organizations. All in all, we are working together with more than 15 partner organizations in all parts of the world. Mostly in, they are mostly located in the global south and east. And you see some of them are listed there. Um, all people here sitting on, uh, on the panel are representatives of our partner organizations. We also have an advisory board, and our advisory board consists of 26 experts from around the, the globe. And when I say experts, I mean not only researchers who do research on trans issues, but also trans activists, because we have this impression that there is a living experience and living um, an expertise from trans people as living experts as activism as activists, and we found it important uh, to include them too. So from every region, we have at least one uh, researcher and one activist. And these experts have reviewed all our questionnaires, and this is to produce really transcultural uh, questionnaires, uh, questionnaires that can be used uh, in every part of the world. And I. I'd like to shortly focus on the project structure. 
So TGU is the main project. Uh, TGU receives money from funders. These are the Open Society Foundations and the Arcus Foundation in the US and the German Heinrich Bell Foundation here in Berlin, which hosts this event. And it's not only the money. Um, it's also the empowerment which comes from which comes through acknowledgement from and support of people like Michael Heflin from the Open Society Foundations or Carla Sutherland from the Arcus Foundation or Jana Mittag here in Berlin from the Heinrich Bell Foundation, which is very important and which helps us a lot. So thank you. And of course, central to the project uh, is the cooperation and the exchange with our partner organizations and our, our advisory board members, and this is the heart of the project structure. This is the main thing. And we as the coordinate, coordinate, coordination and research team, Jan and myself, we are collecting and analyzing all the data. Um, we work and transform the data, and then we provide the data um, to the public, the movement, and the institutions. And we do this in form of press releases and also of, in form of maps and other advocacy tools that can be used in the movements. For example, uh, before the Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is a very important uh, day for the trans movement, uh, before the Transgender Day of Remembrance, we present our data from the Trans Matter Monitoring Project in form of name lists so that activists can better prepare for this day. And also we translate... Um, important human rights documents in different languages. You can see them outside on the table, like the uh, issue paper of Thomas Hammerberg, the Commissioner for Human Rights in the Council of Europe. And we also provide data and research results to different institutions, um, such as the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union, the uh, Council of Europe, or the OSZE, or the UN. Um, yes, and our project has a threefold project structure. We have three sub projects. The first one is the Transmitter Monitoring, which is very, very well known compared to the other ones, and often people confuse this project with the GVT project, but it's only some it's only one sub project and Jan will um, explain it in detail. And the other one is mapping the legal situation, which actually is mapping the legal and social situation. And the third one is contextualization or evaluation and contextualization. And I will talk about the latter ones later a bit more, but now Jan is presenting the Transmitter Monitoring. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, it's been a great experience the last few days where we had a workshop with these activists sitting on the table, and it's a great opportunity to be here and share some of this experience here. Okay, do you hear me now? Okay, fantastic. That was just to appreciate uh, the experience I had with these other activists sitting here. So uh, the Transmitter Monitoring started in April 2009 as a joint project between Transgender Europe and the Liminalis Journal on a voluntary basis, and the main aim was to um, show the extent of violence that trans people face in different parts of the world, and that this violence includes very extreme forms up to murders. Um, so the aim is to systematically monitor, collect, and analyze reports on homicides of trans people. And results are published at least twice a year in English and Spanish, and there are special editions for events like the International Transgender Day of Remembrance or the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. Our last update is from September 2011, and it covers the period of January to uh, January 2008 to 25th September of 2011. And um, so, unfortunately, I have to present you like a part of the extreme forms of transphobia. So, uh, we are going to hear more about good practices later on, and I hope this doesn't become too depressing. Uh, since 2008, we've registered 681 reports of murdered trans people in 50 countries, and in this year, we've already registered 116 reports in 23 countries. <clears throat> 
On this map, you can see the absolute numbers registered between 2008 and 2010. Most cases are from Brazil. Uh, it needs to be taken into account that Brazil has a very large population of almost 200 million people. Um, also, there's reporting practices. The local movement is monitoring itself, and also in news reports, often reports are reported as reports of uh, as murders of trans people. Um, so, if there's uh, blank spaces on the map, it doesn't mean that no murders happen, only that we don't have reports of them as yet. On our website, we also have an interactive map which, um, where you can find details of each individual case. Oops. Um, and this map also helps us to become more interactive in the sense that people can see what kinds of reports are registered and which ones might be missing. So as I said already, the, men, the data show only reported cases and that can be found either on the internet or through reports that we receive from our partner organizations or from other sources. Uh, as there are dozens of languages used in the internet and also a variety of terms for trans people, we certainly uh, don't find all the reports that are out there. Furthermore, not all trans people who are murdered are identified as trans in the reports. Uh, witness will later on speak of this situation in some countries in Africa where many people, un, uh, many trans people are identified as gays or in many cases probably in reports not even identified as gay or trans at all. Um, so there are certain limitations and for these reasons the data only show the tip of the iceberg of murders of trans people committed around the world and the reality is much worse. Here you can see a list of all of the countries and the numbers of reports since 2008 in brackets uh, grouped in the six world regions. In Africa, we have two reports so far. In Asia, most reports are from Malaysia, Pakistan and the, and the Philippines. In Europe, we have 13 reports in Italy and 17 in Turkey. Also, we have two in Germany. In Central and South America, most reports are from Brazil, Colombia, Mexico and Venezuela. If you would... Uh, put that in relation of population sizes, uh, other places would also uh, appear quite problematic, so we need to keep that in mind. These are the absolute numbers. In North America, we have 46 reports from the USA, and in Oceania, we have four reports. So overall, most reports of murdered trans people found in the, are found in the three regions, Central and South America, 533 reports since January 2008. In North America, in the USA, 46 reports. And in Europe, 43 reports of murdered trans people since 2008. Given the sources that we have and that they're based mostly on uh, news reports, it's not easy to classify all of the murders as transphobic murders. So in our mapping, we don't talk about transphobic murders, but of murders of trans people. However, if you look at many of the reports, the brutality or other characteristics indicate that in many cases, either transphobia or specific living situations of trans people, such that as they have to work as sex workers on the streets at night, um, increase the risk of being murdered, um, and so in many cases there are clear indications of <coughs> transphobia or um, living conditions being um, related to the murders. In July, two th in, in July 7th, sorry, on July 7th this year, Talia was murdered in Chihuahua in Mexico, and numerous shots were fired from a passing car at her and at other trans women that were together with her. Uh, this is one of many cases where there was um, murder of a person that happened in the context of a shooting directed at a group, not at an individual. The shoot shots were uh, fired from a passing car. So this is... Um, we, have, we, we, we don't know for 100% sure, but it seems that it was an attack on a, on a group of trans people rather than an, an, um, a murder motivated by some other motive directed at the person. Yeah, as, I said, as I said before, I will present very briefly now um, the two other sub-projects. Sub and for the mapping and legal for the mapping of the legal and social situation, we uh, created an expert questionnaire. This expert questionnaire was designed to map uh, the legal and social situation of trans people on a worldwide scale. Therefore, we created it in a um, transcultural design. And as I said before, uh, all our questionnaires were reviewed by our 
advisory board member, so they helped us a lot to make it a real transcultural one. And the first research um, was done with this expert questionnaire, and we will see the results uh, soon presented by all these uh, wonderful people. And next one. And the questionnaire addresses a range of issues that are important for trans people. Not only the legal situation, we included also aspects of uh, trans-related healthcare and, of course, the trans movement and community itself. And it was a very complex questionnaire with more than 30 pages, and it was filled, out, filled in by at least one or two experts in every country. So in the end, we received detailed information for a total of 50, country, 50 countries from our partner organizations in the global south and east and from voluntary working activists in Europe and Australia so far. And I will now show different ways of how we present the data on our website. For example, this is gender recognition in South Africa. I won't go into detail because witness to my next, she is explaining the situation in South Africa. I just want to show uh, in which ways we uh, present the data. And this is from the country section. We have two different sections. One is the country section and one is the section where we present the comparative data in form of uh, tables and maps. And in the country section, we have mainly two versions. One is the brief version, or brief section, which is like this, like this table where you see the information in a very clear way. And then we have another version, which is the uh, elaborated version, where there is more context data, more information, more detailed information, also cit citations, references, and links. And... Um, this table, as I said before, is uh, showing the gender recognition legislation, legislation in South Africa. And uh, for the African continent, this is a very progressive one, uh, or maybe the only one. Um, witness will um, explain it much better than I can. But I want to show that we not only um, present the legislation in theory, but also in, pra in practice. In the, in the remark section, you see that the practice of the law is totally different. So what we try to do is not only present the legal situation, but also the social situation, because on paper it looks perfect, but in reality there's a lot of things to do. And um, witness will explain this. So this is one way how we present the evaluation of the legal uh, mapping. And we also have comparative data. This is uh, a very new table. You can't find it on the website yet because it's very fresh and we are still in a developing process and uh, discussing this together with our friends. And here this one is about trans-specific healthcare specifically about hormone therapy. And again, we try to uh, map the data such that it reflects the complexity of the matter, but still being intu intuitively uh, understandable. For example, um, we do not provide only data if there is um, a medically um, supervised hormone therapy. You see it if there is a, a, a green mark. If there is no, then you see there's no entry sign. But also, if there are alternatives, and if there is uh, medically supervised hormone therapy, what are the requirements? Often the requirements are psychiatric diagnosis, which means pathologization and also stigmatization. So uh, if there is no... Um, medically supervised hormone therapy or if the requirements couldn't be met by the trans people or won't be met by the trans people because of the stigmatization, uh, people um, invent alternatives like going to pharmacies, buying contraceptive pills or um, organizing their hormones on the black market. And these alternatives um, can lead to serious health problems. So that's why we um, included this too. And this is um, a very interactive map. If you click on the on the icons, you can see much more detailed information. And in the next the next uh, tables are regarding the situation uh, regarding uh, criminalization and prosecution. And here we differentiate between. Uh, 
criminalization and prosecution for a specific reason. Often you see or you hear reports that are saying, for example, there are 70 countries in the world that criminalize homosexual relationships. And if you do this with, um, with trans-related issues like so-called cross-dressing, for example, um, you have to differentiate because there are countries where um, uh, so-called cross-dressing is criminalized, but the laws are not acted upon and the people are very well acknowledged. We will see an example of Tonga soon. And then there are countries where there are no laws that um, criminalize people or trans people, but there are other laws that are not specific on trans people but are specifically used against trans people, such as noisance laws. So you have to differentiate between the laws that are actually um, uh, directed against trans people and the laws that are uh, used and uh, that are criminalizing trans people. And now I will very briefly come to the third subproject, contextualization. And while we did this first research, all the, re um, the research results we present here now in the following were part of the first research, uh, we faced a lot of challenges. And when I say we, then we mean not only the TVT team, but also our partner organizations. And therefore, we invited our partner organ or representatives of our partner organizations um, to come to Berlin uh, for several reasons. First, uh, to evaluate the first research phase to see what was good, what was bad. Second, to present the research results of the first research together, so that not we present the research results, but we do it all together. And thirdly, to do training in peer research. And most important, to design the second uh, the, to design the second research all together. This is what we did the last days. Um, and what we will continue tomorrow. And now is the last slide. Um, this is very brief, the structure or um, an overview of the second research. This will be in survey on tr experiences of trans respect and transphobia, and it will be a combination of research and empowerment. And um, we will do this with uh, peer interviews, and the peer interviews are a mean of getting data and empowerment at the same time. We will train the interviewers so they get empowerment and that they are able to empower the interviewees. And all together, working as a team, which we realized in the last days, is, a, is an empowering experience uh, from the beginning. And we are very closely cooperating with the local movement, so they will also um, experience empowerment in their local structures. And yeah, this will uh, focus on only few countries. You see some of them here, and that's it. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Carla, for and, and Jan for this thorough presentation. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first. Um, guest who is sitting just right um, to the left of me. Um, it's Agnivia Lahiri from Calcutta, India. She's the executive director of People Like Us and a transgender youth activist. Um, Agniva is a research scholar at the Gender and AIDS Training Institute in the Asia and the Pacific um, and holds a master degree in sociology. Agnivia also coordinates the network of Asia-Pacific Youth, the regional youth-led network promoting, um, promoting, protecting, and advancing um, the participation and rights, particularly the sexual and reproductive health and rights in 19 countries in Asia, Asia and the Pacific. Agnivia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Namaste, namaskar, uh, assalamu alaikum. And a good afternoon to beautiful people. I'm from South Asia. So let's talk about something about the situation of the trans people in South Asia. Just before that, Carla and Jan actually talking about so many serious things. So let's talk about something fun. And that is, we are talking about law, legal issues and all this. Have you ever seen a law which is movable? Have you ever seen a law which can come down to you and say, hello? No? Look at me. 
I am the mobile public nuisance act. <laughs> In my country, because I born with a particular genitalia, I dress, I cross dress, and I consider as a public nuisance act everywhere. So I'm a mobile public nuisance act. So beautiful peoples, let's uh, introduce my, uh, I mean region, in uh, particular to focus on India, the trans situation uh, in South Asia, and focus on India. Uh, so this is a South Asian map. And initially, we thought of we are going to cover five countries, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka. And, uh, but finally, we only able to collect the data of 10 states in India, which is already shared with the TVT project, and it will be uploaded soon at their website. And we have already collected data from other South Asian countries, but it's not been shared with the team, but it will be soon on uploaded in the website. So here, predominantly, I'm going to talk about more on the India-specific findings, but with a very special uh, focus on the, some other South Asian development. The human rights situation, in particular the legal situation of transgender uh, uh, in, in India. There are innumerable human rights violations in India with respect to the trans population. The struggle for legal identity is still going on. However, with the Delhi High Court judgment on July 2, 2009, expression like sexual orientation and LGBT have been introduced in the Indian constitution, but there is no separate recognition of gender identities or of transgender groups per se. Legal identification documents such as passport, election commission issued voter identity card, and the census has introduced an option for others, for those who do not identify as male or female, but this does not provide scope for individuals' trans identities per se. There is still no provision to change your gender on their birth certificates. There's no laws which criminalize trans population on issues of cross-dressing, like me, directly. However, there are many other laws which are indirectly used to harass us, such as Public Nuisance Act. But we are not going to talk about all negative things. India is great. So let's talk about something, affirmative action. The Indian census enumeration, for which began earlier this year, will no longer remain blind to hijras and transgender people, but will include a new identity, male, female, and other, which can be claimed by transgender people. This development follows on an earlier move in 2009 to issue voter identity cards that recognize this category of others. The process of decriminalization, hijras and transgender and people who want to live in same-sex relationship has begun. That's also remind me, it's only in 2006, the Indian Passport Office gave recognition to what is now known as third gender, and hijras wishing to identify themselves as such can do now so. But recognition is one thing, amalgamation into a normal or mainstream society is quite another. Hijra may now be counted in the census or be able to cast votes, but will they get jobs? Things have begun to move on the front too, on paper at least. A recent suggestion by the Chief Justice of the Madras High Court that there should be a reservation for third sex in government jobs and education has been a catalyst for discussion on the rights and entitlements of people on the margins of the society. Tamil Nadu is a state down south that has pursued an open policy towards transgender people, giving them the title of Aravanis and setting up place a number of supportive measures, including setting up a special state welfare board for transgender, reservation in the educational system, uh, and free sex reassignment surgeries. The Karnataka and other South Indian states, the Karnataka government passed a resolution entitling transgender 15% reservation under the category 2A of the Backward Class Commission and a municipal corporation of 
New Delhi recently announced a monthly pension scheme of transgender people and the National Legal Authority Service called NALSA has now included transgender in a definition of marginalized group which entitles us to receive free legal aid. The problem is we the transgender people are relegated by ourselves and by others to be as beggars. For acceptance, for dignity, for equal opportunity, and not for a rightful recipients of it. And just like the good old saying, beggars are not choosers, whatever the powers that be give us, we just have to accept like an obedient, hungry dog to its master. Let's talk about some neighbor countries. The first one is really sexy, huh? darling of Chief Justice. 2009, when the regime changed in Pakistan, the Chief Justice of Pakistan take a lot of initiative for securing rights of the marginalized group and transgender population. Now, police of Pakistan, whenever they saw the transgender people, they say, oh, you're the darling of Chief Justice. So we, the darling of Chief Justice of Pakistan, hey, uh, what we have gained so far uh, in Pakistan, legal recognition, the rights of inherent, inheritance, equal rights for uh, casting vote, and uh, right uh, to legal remedies. In Nepal, we, we have recognized as a third gender. Uh, they can issue a passport and other legal document as third gender. And also, uh, the same-sex marriage, the only country in the re region that accepts same-sex marriage. Uh, but that's very limited. <laughs> the situation uh, in India in a social study, uh, we, the people, uh, observe as a deviant people who are polluting the society, destroying the culture, values of the country. Uh oh. Trans people cannot, like, cannot attend school, well I attend school, uh, or be employed, I'm employed, uh, as uh, we are discriminated at all levels of ranks of the society, but I'm privileged. There is some form of acceptance for the group, but only in traditional occupations such as begging or uh, uh, which is uh, like in the street and badhai, which is a blessing for the hijra communities. Here as well, we are often abused and harassed due to the lack of social acceptance. Often we are pushed to the sex work, I never, I wish, or are uh, sexually abused by a police or other public with no grievance redressal. We are considered to be illegal group and denied our basic rights which we are entitled to us as a citizen of a country. In healthcare settings, health services access to them is for the area where the discrimination is worst. Often uh, we, we uh, conceive as a pollutants and the carriers of a disease such as HIV and AIDS. Due, due to this attitude, often available methods of castration and sex reassignment surgeries are unsafe and lead to deaths or complications for, uh, for people who undergo with them. HIV positive trans people undergo multiple levels of discrimination, but because of our gender identity and HIV status, we often left out many governmental schemes and policies and even uh, the players in the development sector who work in the health and HIV issues end up discriminating against us. Castration, which is the only method available for our transformation, is an illegal uh, process and it's not a victim-friendly law. Most of the time when we go for castration, we have a uh, uh, UTI uh, problem, which is a uh, urethral uh, tract infection problem. And then if you go to the government hospital, you may be treated, but then you have end up with, with a lockup. What needs to be done? Efforts need to be made multiple level, both within the community and outside. The community has to be empowered on their rights. They need to be brought together for their struggle. They need basic information and service to help them rise above basic everyday struggle, to be able to fight for larger good 
of the community, legal recognition of the community at all levels, provision of healthcare facilities have to be made by sensitizing the healthcare providers and empowering members from community to act as community leaders in spearheading this, who work with the families, neighborhood and immediate surroundings of the community. Sensitizing needs to be done with police, administration, government official, policymaker. And hello, we need representation of trans people like here and please come to our country and share your realities. Thank you so much. <laughs> So thank you, Agniva, for sharing with us, the, with us the legal, social, and social situation of trans people in India, and not forgetting about presenting the difficulties um, and presenting the difficulties arising from the insufficient legal framework. However, not forgetting to present the good um, practices in your regions and uh, what has been achieved in the last years. Um, this now brings us to our next speaker who is a very good friend of mine, Christian Randelovic, um, from Serbia. He is an activist and working and cooperating with the unofficial Belgrade Gender Dysphoria Medical Team in order to provide help and support for other trans persons for more than 14 years by now. He started in 2006 working with the organization Gaten LGBT, and that is based in Belgrade. And he has also contributed to the creation of trans programs in Croatia and Bosnia. Um, he is as well a member of the Steering Committee of Transgender Europe and their functions um, as the contact person for Eastern Europe. Please, Chris. Um, can you see the board behind me? Because I can't see not. I, I don't. I can not see my presentation. That's okay. But this is. Uh, thank you for for being here. I'm from really really close country. Yeah, Eastern Europe, but here Serbia. You know us. Uh, we banded. Uh, we have banded uh, police and state banded our pride two days ago. So maybe you know where we are. Uh, I want to talk and share some things about the Eastern part of Europe. That's a problem. Big problem. There is no trans people visible at all. Believe it or not, in almost uh, 12 countries, there are no organization which are helping people, trans people. There is no at all trans organization, and people are not visible in public spaces at all. In five countries, there is no uh, there is no services. They are not recognized. They are not existing. They are not commu communicating with each other. That's very very hard for them. Those countries are Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Macedonia, and Montenegro. Um, on personal level, people are meeting whenever they realize they're trans. They gather in houses, but they are not recognized as trans on state level. What does it mean? That means that when you say trans in Eastern Europe, the first thought of the people is on transvestites. They're not aware there's so many trans identities. Uh, most are visible, if they are visible, most visible are transsexuals because they can be treated. That's the first thing in this part of Europe, and it's main thing, how you perceive trans person. As person that can be treated medically, so you can provide health care for the person, and that's it. Many transgender people are forced to be, as Agniva said, to be a sex worker, working in the sex industry. Uh, keep in mind that uh, in some countries, of course, the sex work is forbidden. So that's hard to survive on. Most of the things you can, uh, you can find in this part of Europe uh, is the medical team that's working with, with transsexuals, of course. Uh, most people are searching for help, but they're not aware they, can, they don't have to go all through the way. Uh, Trans teams and problems are uh, maybe less treated than gays and bisexuals and uh, lesbians teams, but most of the uh, LGBT groups, LGBT groups, are pushing trans people on the border 
And there's a divide between trans community and all her self-identities. Uh, why I say this? Because in some countries, you cannot, if you're trans, you cannot go into the bar or you cannot be in a club as visible as you are. So that's, that's a big problem. One of the problems is also the medical approach through all those countries. Not a human approach, just medical approach so people can be treated and can be healed. Uh, that's a chance in, in those countries. Serbia is uh, known of her team, which is working, I mean medical team, medical experts working almost 20 years there. But the transgender people are not visible. Uh, as we started a group in uh, 2006, the trans people realized they can be seen. They can talk to each other. They can uh, make a network with others, make a connection to exchange, of course, the situation, the needs and everything. So that was the first thing. And that's when TGU helped. We started an Eastern European group with Victor, my colleague Victor and Richard. And we're trying to empower people in other countries that there is no, there is nothing for the trans people. Um, in most most countries, uh, there is no uh, there is uh, anti discrimination law, but there is uh, th two countries that that law doesn't exist, and most of the anti discrimination law doesn't recognize trans as transsexuals or transgender. They have no any kind of regulation for trans people. The two countries that, that they don't have uh, anti discrimination law are Bosnia and Macedonia. They are still fighting for that. Um, People are still fighting for the uh, regulation. Of course, most of the countries don't have visible people. Of course, they don't have no regulation, no law regulation at all. So that's, of course, a problem. And that's absurd. In Serbia, you can change your sex, but you cannot, but you can change your papers, of course, but that's not regulated at all. So that's, that's the funny thing about Serbia. It's absurd. Um, in some some countries, uh, in some some countries, is the uh, countries in Eastern European re region and ex Yugoslavia region, is very very hard to get any kind of documents that could be recognized by. So people are fighting to get to change their gender marker or to ch change their say social security number. That's a big issue too, because all the names in Eastern European countries are gendered. So you cannot do that. We have uh, so much violence in uh, this part of Europe, and transphobia is among all the people, general public people, LGB people, so high. People are being beaten, and unfortunately, few, few, fewer friends died. So we are part of TVT project monitoring the murders. So that's not good. Uh, the the most vulnerable vulnerable uh, population part of population are uh, trans women, recognized as sex workers, and they uh, suffer from severe violence uh, by police, by family, by by people on the street. So every everywhere is violence, and that's that's really really hard. Uh, because a few few days ago, a friend of mine was beaten on the street because. She was just recognized as such. So it's a big problem also. Uh, trans people don't gather in public place, places. They're not, they're not, um, they're not, they don't want to do that. Uh, even for the, for the pride, there was no trans people on the pride. They didn't want it to come, no, because they're afraid. Uh, that, that's the real life. Um, in some countries, uh, people are uh, gathering, I told you already, are gathering at home. So there are, uh, some, some countries, they don't have good connections. They don't have such internet developed uh, connections. So they're trying to get to the others in the other countries. And it's very hard to get to, to know someone. So please, as Agniva said, please come to Serbia. Please, please, please. Uh, we can we can help also. Uh, we can. Uh, I mean, there is there is an idea to to increase visibility, of course, so people can be seen, recognized, uh, empowered by that. That's that's the idea to form the groups or maybe even organizations that could be helpful. Of course, money is issue, but you know, we can live. Uh, of course, the the empowering is how to to empower people to to get their job to. To, to help society, to help themselves, so we can help each other. And of course, we are trying to advocate if, as, as, as we can, working with old people. So please come to Serbia and 
be there with us. Thank you. So thank you, um, Chris, for your presentation. Um, and now it's time for you in the audience um, to participate in the discussion um, and ask questions to the speakers and to the panel. I would like to mention for those who are um, listening to us on the internet that there is a possibility to ask questions as well over Twitter. They will be read here in the room. So if you are sitting somewhere out there um, listening um, to us, please send your questions by Twitter. They, they will be read and answered here. Um, for the people in the room, there's two microphones which you can use because there's, it's important for the translators. Um, questions can be um, asked in German and in English. And who wants to go first? Please. And could you briefly introduce yourself? And thank you. Okay. My name is Andrea Kempf. And I'm working at the German Institute for Human Rights in the Department for Development Cooperation. We are Germany's national human rights institution. And um, I have a question first to Ms. Agni Valahiri um, concerning um, one of the points you made about development actors in India. You said that... Um, I don't remember exactly, I couldn't note it down because it was too fast, but you said that even development actors who should be promoting the rights finally end up discriminating and excluding or something trans people from the programs. I would be interested in, yeah, if you could elaborate a bit more on this to have a concrete example because we are still lacking these examples to lobby the ministry. That would be very nice. Thank you very much. Maybe we can collect some questions and then go in an answering round. More questions on that? Oh. oh yes, please. Um, yeah, uh, Michael, I'm, I'm just here as a journalist and taking uh, the minutes. Uh, and my question goes to Christian. Um, I was missing countries like Belarus and Russia in your report. Uh, can you say something about the situation there? Okay, okay then maybe we start. While the two people are answering the questions, you can think about um, the next ones. Please, Agniva, and then Chris. Well, uh, there's several, but I just want to give one example, which I'm really tempted to. Uh, the development activists came, uh, started working on the human rights education among the Hitra community. They started questioning about the hierarchical system within the Hitra community exist, the guru and chela, like the like the guru is the is the highest authority, and the chelas are the uh, the one who who join newly. There's a control. There is a control by the guru uh, over the chelas. Now, the human rights activists came, started questioning, hello, you are asking human rights uh, of yours in front of everywhere. What about human rights within your system? My answer to that, to my lovely friend of the human rights activists to that, is that by questioning human right, individual human rights perspective within a community system. Aren't we doing, repeating the same thing when in 1860, British came to India and they, with the Victorian morality, they thought we the people, transgender eunuch, is a criminalized community because we are obnoxious. We cannot fit into the entire system. So they criminalize us. Because from their own, own lens, they look at us, right? So what we are doing, we, the elite human rights activist, bringing our own lens to look at the community, uh, to forget the community rights, to, to forget the community system, and started pouring about the individual human rights concept. 
when when i when my my friends was thrown out at the age of 16 from the family being a transgender no one not a single person accepted except the guru in the hijra gharana she nursed them she pr- give them protection give the education and give the option whether you can willing to join the hijra cult or do something else so the system itself it's a family will you able to ask your father i mean i mean i, I didn't know it it can be happen in some other part of the world but i'm just asking to my indian friends that um, you know in a, in your family if your father is the head of the family and uh, will you and who who took all the all the uh, decision will you go tomorrow morning and ask your father hello father let's have a election within the family members and let's de- decide that who own that election and let that particular person take the decision how the family will go you see the difference like uh, individual human rights uh, activist i mean lens and the community lens we are lacking that but that's just an example i'm i'm that's just an extreme example but i think what what i'm going to talk about is that we are often been uh, looked from the lens of a elite uh, human rights perspective and then we we may have something to say within our structure within our system development activists use us like the entire hiv system hiv is not our priority section 3 when the entire section 377 movement started in in india it was not a priority of hijra community because, and it's still still it's it's a uh, it's not our priority for us because if you look at the how it's section 377 read down is that private consensual sex in private and we the community having sex always in the street so the notion of privacy is nowhere there so if section three, section 377 actually uh, i mean you know uh, apply to us it still apply to us because because uh, it's not i mean the notion of privacy within our community within our system it's something it's quite vague so i think like what i'm going to talk about is that we have we have we have not been discussed uh the way we want it to be uh that develop the the program are being developed without consulting us and without understanding our realities advocacies are designed without uh i mean completely neglecting our realities hiv is maybe uh, the the infection rates are quite high but still we start our discussion with violence so let's talk about violence first then hiv comes so i think like uh, i mean the community has their priority and please look at their priorities not the uh, donor agenda thank you for the question um my colleague is uh is working on that part of europe but the information i have that the russian region i mean ex sorry the union region is better organized and uh, the people are more visible much more visible than this part of europe uh i know they're having few organizations working with trans and i think they have uh, in one country uh, organization trans organization but uh, i want to uh, emphasize something that we supposed to understand how does it work but it doesn't work regionally of course it's not uh, the region uh, this part actually was like region in balkan balkan countries are still fighting some are getting into european union some of them are not still in transitioning part so that i think that's very unhelpful for trans people of course get, being together is helpful to see someone else see diversity but it's not helpful in terms of organizing things so trans people in other parts of eastern europe are more organized and more more seen visible i mean so i can get more information usually thanks okay yeah there are further questions yes please Uh, hello, my name is Faith Bosworth. I'm from an NGO called Tactical Tech. Uh, we work a lot around information and data for advocacy, so that's kind of the 
uh, angle my questions are coming from. Um, I mean, you're collecting a lot of really interesting data, and I'm kind of interested at this stage if you have an idea at the end what kind of story you want to tell with it, or it's enough that you've just collected it and been able to map uh, across the world where things are happening. And then connected to that, what about these gaps? Uh, for example, looking at the map of Africa, I was struck that there were only two uh, records, and I'm pretty sure that there are probably more. And I mean, obviously, it's very ambitious to try to collect data from across the world. So how do you overcome kind of those gaps and misleading people potentially to think that there isn't a problem when there is? And the last thing is, um, what is your plan? How are you monitoring the impact of this project? Do you have any examples of ad advocacy groups using this data that you're collecting for their campaigning? And yeah, I guess what is your main aim around that? Thanks. Mm, thanks for the question. Regarding the last part of the impacts, when when I first presented when I presented the first results of the Transmatter Monitoring Project in July 2009 in, in Copenhagen on the um, Outgames Conference, Outgames Human Rights Conference, I was very, very surprised that we, we published the data five days before, and after the presentation, someone from the audience stood up and said he was um, one of the organizers or one of the team leaders in a, a Danish LGBT asylum rights group, and he used the data of our project um, to help uh, getting asylum for trans people from Russia and Turkey, because we just uh, presented all the data about the situation in these countries. And we often come along um, aspects and impacts uh, we didn't uh, expect. So there's a, we started to, then we started, as we, as we saw also negative reactions, especially from trans people saying, oh my God, all these murders, uh, I don't dare going out of the house. So we started to also uh, balance the, the project when we developed the project into uh, trans respect versus transphobia, so that we also want to present um, um, examples of trans respect and balancing all. And what we see is there's always the, the question of measurement in uh, when you have to write uh, the report to your funders. And we see a, a, a huge measurement in that we regularly are um, receiving reports on LGBT human rights or on transphobia and homophobia to review the trans part of these um, of these reports because we got all the data and we can evaluate these things. So this is this is one major impact. And regarding the blind spots, this is very, very difficult. There are so many challenges and I don't want to tell about Africa because Witness is presenting this and Witness is presenting exactly why these problems are, that there are no reports in Africa. That has to do with the situation, how trans people are view, uh, 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 viewed in Africa. And I don't want to go into detail because that's a uh, Witness part. Um, I think what is important uh, is uh, regarding the aims of the project is two things. One is that um, the aims are being developed in uh, relation and in cooperation with partner organizations and um, in the process of the unfolding research and also in relation to discussions in the trans community. So, for instance, the very fact that we are focusing on issues of, of violence is related to the fact that, as uh, Agniva said, within many trans communities, this is an issue that tends to be neglected in LGBT debates, either because uh, there's a notion of uh, hate crimes that views only certain forms of discrimination directed at lesbian and gay people and not other forms of extreme violence uh, trans people suffer. Um, also because um, lots of the debates focus on HIV AIDS, for instance. So this is one level. Um, and um, and, and uh, another uh, issue to bear in mind is that um, we are also careful not to too quickly direct the results into a certain direction because it's up, often up to local groups and movements to use the results for their purposes. Nonetheless, we aim to uh, work on a best practice catalogue from international examples. Um, so I guess like to, to answer it shortly, like the, that's an orientation towards the movement because also the project is coming from Transgender Europe, so that's an umbrella organisation of lots of organisations already. Um, regarding um, the, the map that you saw... Um, 
we are always, when we are presenting it, very careful not just to show the map, but to, to say that the blind spots don't mean that nothing is happening. But there's also another part uh, of the story to it. If you look at uh, the results that were known um, coming from the activities around the Transgender Day of Remembrance since 1998, 99, um, the lists contained mostly people in the United States, and very, although it was meant to memorialize people around the world, uh, there were very little reports at all from outside of the United States. So if you look at um, the, that side of the story, you could look at the glass as half empty or half full. So obviously, regarding all the blind spots, it's half empty. But if you look at the progress that has been made in uh, gathering data from a variety of other places in the world and through our, uh, due to our strengthening corporations, um, we are receiving more and more reports. You can also see at this part of the story that uh, more reports are getting known. Um, but also, um, I mean, the, as Julia said, like the transmitter monitoring was like a main starting point of the project and the main issue, but the project is now really broadening out. So, uh, And it's exactly part of the reason like our funders sometimes ask us, isn't that too much to have three sub-projects? Why don't you focus just on, on, on one project? But the idea is precisely through these multiple layers to address some of the challenges in that way. So, yeah. Thank you. Are there more questions? Ah, yes, please. Hello, uh, my name is Anna. Um, I'm a member of Abbey Queer in Berlin, but I'm here just of personal interest. And I was wondering to both of you, Christian and Agniva, um, if you, I don't know much about it, but I was just wondering if you see a big difference for um, trans women and trans men and people that don't exclusify, exclusively identify as either one um, in the movements but also in the general social situation in your region's countries. Uh, if I understood correctly, you are asking about like uh, trans men, trans women, gender variant, all other gender queer, non-identified, and how they are located within the movement, right? Is that your question? Good. Thank you. Uh, I think, like, um, uh, we, uh, I mean, if I would say from the Indian perspective, I'd like to say that we we coined the term gender variant person in 2000, and then with, with which is within the... Um, which is within the you know institutionalized movement itself, which is uh, because we are fed up with the uh, word called MSM, and it's like men who have sex with men, and it doesn't mean anything. It's actually nutshell. And then uh, we thought like you know let's talk about something. And then I mean we started talking about the gender uh, gender not gender queer per se. It's a very academic term, but the but the uh, but the uh, gender variant people. I think we are successful enough because a lot of people. Who who are uh, who may not be because you know like initially transgender when you, when you say trans it's always think of a transsexual and then you know like going for a uh, like looking like a Jackie B with the big boobs and all this and then a, a lot of people might not be going for that and then uh, they they have the feelings internal feelings the the soul and they they, they wanted to nurture that and then and then like uh, what what we have understood within within the movement and also movement in a way not a very institutional movement but even in writing and an article in newspapers and you know like uh, having a conversation particularly within the youth group uh, where where still people are thinking of whether they they I mean they choose to their identity we have a discoursement on on, on issues like that and then um, i think like uh, per se i think they are much more vulnerable uh, cuz a, uh, there's no space for them uh, because the variety 
of of identity or or looking identity like you know how how do i perceive identity b is that within the system within the community system we the community people also be uh, very negligible towards them it's like oh uh, that's not a, a, a problem it, it's it, it's not a problematic issue i mean we have so many other problems please i mean you come next day so you know like i think within the community also we are quite negligible to towards them and perhaps i'm not blaming to my community perhaps we are not able to understand their realities because of uh, because of lack of our our own knowledge so i think like uh, i i ask you to come up uh, to come together so let's do something at least from berlin here so let's do something and be part something in the in the tvt research project let's expand the horizon and then uh, let let's see how vulnerable they are will you <laughs> come 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 <laughs> work together to understand that to measure that please walk through serbia please <laughs> <laughs> um thank you <laughs> yeah i'm in stone age i mean i'm not that old but serbia is um we're still really in dark dark ages we are we're in europe we're not european union that's our excuse <laughs> of course um we are walking together with Hooligans, fans, religious fanatics. If you, if we, we, we have them. I think uh, we are. There's no varieties. That's a problem. There's no variety. When I say this, it's really a problem when you say trans. When you see, when you read the paper in Serbia, there's uh, all this sensational things about the boobs, about the changes. about the makeup and all of those things you know but there is no people there that's not for people people are um variety of people are the people they, they don't know about it that's the main thing the berlin is a revelation for me revelation because i've been to so many places and you're here living really low stop you can do whatever you want you don't have to change your sex wow that's for some part of europe wow you don't have to do it not all the way but that that's the that, that's the main thing people are, are not aware their diversities in some part of europe sure. they're not aware of that so that, that that that's the please walk let's walk together really <laughs> through 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 some countries yeah that's that that's for east east part you know that's not for all, all countries but for some that's that's the real life people are not aware that trans people can be also gay has been they're not aware of that they're afraid of that when i say hijras they're oh let's find the dictionary what's that that's real life in some part thanks so if there are no uh ah uh, now i just wanted to close the floor but okay then i'll take the, these two questions um with and then i'll close the floor hi my name's saria um i'm here for personal interest and i myself identify as non binary gendered um my question is to agniva with regards to south asia there's opportunity for trans individuals to obtain identity papers and documentation under the other this um choice is that not of concern that that just outs those individuals to further discrimination prejudice abuse my question um concerns the sort of the schedule for putting online the best practices and the contextualization i was just wondering when you think that you will be able to provide this <laughs> why why can i ask maybe you can briefly ask and the first and then agniva can okay we um, had finish. to postpone this to next year i'm very sorry <laughs> 
we still have no data because we are overwhelmed with work at the moment and this is, um, yeah. I'm sorry. Quickly, uh, first of all, this O, oh, the other identity, is actually introduced in India, not all the South Asian countries. Except Nepal, they have in introduced the third gender, which they, uh, they have officially endorsed it. Now, the point is that, which I've also mentioned, that um, is, uh, uh, A, uh, it's all in paper, first of all. Uh, even though, like in 2006, the Indian passport office issued the word, first initially they used the word E, which is eunuch, which is a very derogatory term. Then uh, we fight, it, it's changed, it's become T, which is the trans, and then, then now it's become O. So we have a passport of transgender, you can see E, T, and O. Huh. And now, now the issue is that, uh, but that's only for the passport office. The immigration authorities never been consulted. So if I am having a passport of T and coming to Germany, the German immigration authority, will, what does it mean, T? <laughs> you, I mean, you know, like it's, it's, it should be, you know, it is just not a one, one particular process. It should be followed by a process. That's number one. So that's never been done. And now, as I mentioned, that we uh, the recognition of trans identity by the voter identity, uh, I mean, election commission issued voter identity card, the passport, and also the census. Uh, by the way, uh, I'd like to say in Calcutta, we have um, uh, 10 million people uh, in, the, in the city, and uh, they have found only three transgender by the census. One of them is me. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so imagine, imagine like it's, and in my office, there's a 27 staff anyway. So, so that is, that is the basic process. And then finally, what I say, like um, they have used uh, one way they use the word O and in other ways they use the word T. So there's a lot of confusion. First of all, that. Second thing I must uh, say that it is really a concern for all of us because particularly the India is coming up with the UID, which is the unique identification, the national identity number. And then it's a biometric card. And then if it's you have put it your identity, you cannot change. And always we argue as a trans activist that we should have a chance, just not a one-time change. If I, today I feel I'm, I try to be a woman, that's fine. And tomorrow I, I could have feel I'm a man, that's it. So do I have the flexibility to do that? If in the 2011 we are introducing the unique identity card, can we have the flexibility? We don't have any answer. The government of India is, is actually clueless. They say, like, why? Why changing and coming back? So that's their answer. <laughs> and, and then, I mean, you know, it, it's not fun, but I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the international uh, communities actually uh, wrote a lot of email to me, particularly asking about the same question which you have asked, that whether putting a, a group of a people under the O doesn't mean that, you know, putting them in a corner of a room where they are, you know, attracted more violence. Uh, I think it is, but as uh, Carla was yesterday mentioning that um, uh, John, John, ARC International, John Fisher, John, John Fisher, Fisher was mentioned, like, let's claim, let's have a ba backlash, let's come together, let's fight, and then let's win the struggle. So even though the O will putting us a corner, let's fight from the corner and let's win. Thank you. Yeah. So when And with these beautiful words, we go to the break and reconvene in 15 minutes. Thank you.